Mr. Pincock, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have to thank ASMO for giving me the opportunity to share this data with the media uh, from different parts of the world. So I have a very interesting study. It's called IPASS to share with you today. It, the long name is a phase-free, randomized, control, open label study of first gefitinib versus chemotherapy taxone carbo in a clinical selected population of non-small cell lung cancer. Why is it important to do this study? Now, in Asia, you know, the incidence of lung cancer is rising. In 2005, in China alone, we estimated that close to half a million of new, lung case, new cases of lung cancer. And this is approximately 20% increase from the year 2000. Smoking is probably the major reason. And of this population, 60 to 70% presented at advanced stage disease. And for this group, chemotherapy is the only choice, as a standard choice. However, there's still a good number of patients who cannot tolerate the chemotherapy and also suffering from the toxicity. But now with the advent of the new targeting drug, we ask the question, can we use this new targeting drug in a first-line setting? So today I'm going to present a result of this IPAS study to show you is a new paradigm in Asia that we can consider gefitinib, an oral targeted agent, as a first-line therapy. Briefly, on the EGFR, sorry about terminology, it's called the epidermal growth factor receptor. When a cancer cell to grow, it tries to sell signal one to another. That's the growth factor. And they have to receive this signal with so-called the uh, so epidermal growth factor receptor, just like a receiver of the signal. And after the signal is activated through an enzyme called tyrosine kinase, the TK, then it leads to a whole series of events, cell proliferation, metastasis, angiogenesis, and the cancer continues to grow. If the drug is able to target the tyrosine kinase, it's able to inhibit its growth. But as you have been demonstrated by Professor Vassell, it is actually the mutated EGFL that are more sensitive to the drug. So presence of the EGFL mutation will make a huge difference whether the drug is going to work or not. Now, so in this study, we enrolled 1,200 patients from around Asia, nine countries. Actually, to be more sensitive, it should be seven countries if you consider Hong Kong and Taiwan to be part of China. Out of this, we select the patient who are adenocarcinoma and left a light smoker. Reason? They are the group with the highest incidence of EGF mutation. We want to enrich a population. If they got enough proportion of patients with the mutation, hopefully they were better with the drug. So we randomized them to a standard drug called gefitinib, which is oral targeted agent around the EGF TKI, versus standard chemotherapy, plaquetaxel, and carboplatinum. And then we look into the progression-free survival, meaning that how long the patient can live without progression of disease, meaning that they have the cancer control and live a reasonable normal life. And other endpoints include the objective response rate as well as EGFL mutation and other biomarkers. Now, this is the result. Go right to the mid. We look into the progression-free survival. The hazard ratio, meaning that you know, the proportion, the chance of this uh, gefitinib is superior over the chemotherapy is 0 0.71. One is equal, less than one, meaning it's better. When you have a hazard ratio of 0 0.74, meaning that there's a 26% chance improvement of the progression-free survival, and the p-value is highly significant. As you can see, the two arms are 609 patients versus 608 patients. The two arms are quite equal in terms of other characteristics. For sake of time, I did not go through the detail, but on Monday when I present, I present the detail of the demographic of the patient. If you look at the survival curve, I mean the progression-free survival curve, it's very interesting. In the first six months, the yellow line is chemotherapy, the green line is the um, gefitinib. It seemed to be superior in the first six months of the chemotherapy arm, and then subsequently, all the way up to the 12, 12 20 months, the gefitinib arm improved over the chemotherapy. Now, I'll explain the reason why there's a crossover about this phenomenon in a moment. And certainly, the DGFM mutation will be our best explanation. In terms of response rate, meaning tumor reduction of the tumor size significantly, 43% with gefitinib arm, 32.2% with the chemotherapy arm. This is pretty well what you expect you know, with the chemotherapy, 30%. And the hazard ratio, 1.59, again, highly significant p-value of 0 0.0001. And then, 
because the drug is oral drug and chemotherapy is toxic, so there is a difference in toxicity. Again, on Monday, I will present the toxicity data in greater detail. But as a result of that, patients can benefit in terms of the quality of life. FACL and TOI, which means that trial outcome index, both document the quality of life patient. As you can see, there are significant difference in terms of quality of life of the gefitinib arm versus the chemotherapy arm. And lung cancer symptoms that are pretty well equal on both sides in a sense that there are tumor control, so both sides benefited from tumor control, but toxicity-wise, it's probably less, and that's why patient has a better quality of life with the oral drug. Now, going to the mutation part, which is very interesting and very much complementary with what Professor Wilson has shown you. In our population, we have 1,200 patients. We managed to obtain samples from 437 of them. I can tell it's not easy to do that in Asia. And out of that, we were able to find close to 60% of the patient with the EGF mutation. If you recall Professor Wessel's data, we are significantly higher in this group of population with the EGFL mutation. And also, you can interestingly see that in the male population, we have 49% of mutation if you select them by non-smoking and adenocarcinoma, as compared to 8.3% in the Western population. So once we select the patient, they are non-smoker, they are adeno, no matter what criteria, whether the good performances, poor performances, performance status, smoking or light smoking, advanced disease, disease or just localized disease, or the different age group, the incidents are quite similar. It's all up into 50, 60 percent chance of having mutation. So which is a very important because as demonstrated in the next slide, the outcome is very much different. If you have the EGFM mutation positive patient and you give them gefitinib or the chemotherapy, you can see that survive, profession free survival curve is significantly better with the gefitinib arm compared to the chemotherapy arm. Hazard ratio, very high, of a very significant of 0 0.48, and again, the p-value is less than 0 0.001. But on the EGFM mutation negative patient, it's the other way around. The chemotherapy patient actually, I mean the patient with EGFM mutation negative, the chemotherapy do better than the gefitinib arm, and again, with a significant p-value. Now, this explains the curve of what we have so observed. In the first six months, the patient without the mutation, the chemotherapy did better. And with time, the patient with the mutation continues to do well and benefit. So in other words, other than just by clinical selection, we're able to demonstrate that the importance of EGFR mutation in this population. And then this has been demonstrated on the response rate, 71.2% if the patient is mutation positive, almost exactly the same as the Spanish data. As for the chemotherapy, interestingly, if they get mutation, they actually have a high response rate of 47%. Mutation negative, if you give them gefitinib, response rate is only 1%. But then the response rate to chemotherapy, if they're mutation negative, is only 23%. This is a very interesting new finding, is that there's a difference of the response rate to chemotherapy, whether mutation positive or mutation negative. So in other words, there are a certain degree of prognostication in the nature. So in summary, what is the implication of IPAS data? I think at this point, I think as a doctor in Asia, we can consider gefitinib as one of the standard first-line therapy if the patient are non-smoker or light smoker and with adenocarcinoma. And secondarily, with this data, we're able to demonstrate that EGF mutation is a very important marker, predictive marker for the EGF RTKI, gefitinib or erotinib. And then, why is it important? Well, you know, in, in, in Asia, about 30% of all lung cancer patients fall into this category. In the Western world, it's about 15%. And so, it's a large number of patients that will offer a new choice for them. And also we demonstrate as a first-line situation, Gefilip is well-tolerated with a much less toxicity and compared to chemotherapy. So I think I can pretty well conclude that this study potentially will change the paradigm of treatment as a first-line situation for a patient with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you very much.